So the people of Israel set out from Ramses and camped at Sukkot. And they set out from Sukkot and camped at Atham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. But then when they leave, they go from Ramesses to Sukkot. Sukkot is in the middle of the of Goshen, it's in the middle of the Wadi Tumalot, and we, we know about the Sukkot. And we, it's known in the Ramesses era. So if in other words, those, those places are all attested in what I would call contemporary Egyptian literature. They cross this area and they come to a, a site we call today Tel El Maskuta, which is ancient Sukkoth of the Bible, or Sukkot. So Ma Sukkot and, Ma, and Sukkot would be the same place. Everybody agrees on that. This is the place in the Wadi Chumalat, the first camping site. And this connected up with a road that led to Canaan called the Way of Shur. So this is quite clearly the direction they are moving to try to get out of Egypt. Now they were supposed to go on the way of the wilderness uh, uh, to Yam Suf. Is that similar to the way of Shur? Well, it's very, uh, it's very difficult. What I'm trying to do is, is provide, uh, to look at all the geographical names we have and see where they, okay. they, they land. I mean, if this is Yam Suf, all of this area here, and maybe even these whole lakes, this whole lake chain of lakes, then we could say that that's another way of, of okay. we know from Exodus 12, 37, and also from the book of Numbers, where we have the itinerary of Moses, that they began at the site called Ramses, now universally accepted to be the site of Kantir here in the northeastern delta. And from there, we're told they, they headed towards Sukkot, which is to the southeast. And the reason we can say that is that we have along this stretch of Greenland, this area known in Egypt as Cheku. Cheku is this, this linear green line heading out towards Sinai. That word Cheku in Egyptian is uh, the word Sukkot in Hebrew. Linguistically, it matches. And the reason we know this is the case is there is a site located just about where that arrow is. And that site today in Arabic is called Tel El Maskuta. The Arabic Maskuta preserves the word Sukkot. So this happens where often the ancient name survives into the Arabic present day name. So you have Sukkot and Maskuta, which tells us they're moving in the southwest, uh, southeasterly direction and they're heading the other way out of Egypt, namely uh, what the Bible calls towards the way of Shur. The Wadi Tumilat is a very old... Uh... However, there is a question of whether all these sites even existed at the time of the Exodus. And, uh, uh, I mean, a Canadian expedition and also Donald Redford thinks it's Tel El Maschuta, but Tel El Maschuta was only uh, built from the, from the late uh, 26th dynasty onwards, when Pharaoh Echo constructed his canal to the Gulf of Suez. So it uh, didn't exist in Ramesside time, so you can dispense with this. In his book, Ancient Israel in Sinai, James Hoffmeyer writes that the name Sukkoth just means a camp, and the site likely got its name because Semites had been camping there for centuries. But if the name Sukkoth just means a temporary encampment, couldn't it apply to just about anywhere that was stopped at by the Israelites? The first campsite, where do you place that? So Tim, my first stop is Sukkot, and it's located about halfway between the exit point, which would be Tel Daba at Goshen, I'll way up there, yeah. all the way down to the Straits of Tehran. But right in here, there's an area where the topography is a little bit difficult for uh, foot, but quite passable, but very difficult for chariots. And so I thought, well, the theological workbook of the Old Testament calls Sukkoth the place where stop the approach is how they translate it. Now, I, I understand it's also booths and tabernacles. I understand that. But why would this be the stop, the approach stop? And down here, there's this beautiful, flat, easy access. Up here, they create a buffer zone so that if the Egyptians were coming, it provided a bit of security, and that's why I placed it 
down on this large area. This is like 18, 20 kilometers wide. Yeah, it'd be a big campsite. That's, yeah. It's big. And, and you know, there's three and a half million Hebrews that are making this migration. Mm -hmm. In 2016, Doug Petrovich, a friend of mine, he published a book called Hebrew, the World's Oldest Alphabet. Now, I got that book, I read it, I loved it, I rejoiced it. I think it's a landmark book. And what he did was he took 15 inscriptions that were called the Sinai inscriptions, and he looked at them and said, well, maybe these are Hebrew. And he translated these as Hebrew inscriptions. Mm -hmm. Nine of these inscriptions come from Wadi Nasb and Sarabit el Kadim. Now, the point is, is that are they Hebrew inscriptions or not? It doesn't actually matter. What does matter is it's very likely during the time of the oppression that there would be Hebrew slaves here. And so as Moses is coming down, mm -hmm. he's gonna stop, send a messenger over, and say, come join us. That may be why Succoth is located here. Now, I had this here before Doug published his book, and it just happened to maybe be a fortunate placement. But I believe personally, after he uh, published his book, I thought, well, maybe that's why there'd be a large number of Hebrews that could join him. Mm -hmm. The first campsite that the Israelites stopped at, Sukkoth, would that have been in Egypt, you think? It could have been. It could have been certainly on the outskirts of Egypt. But to me, the question is immaterial because they were allowed to leave. The Pharaoh said to go ahead and leave. And they, and they took with them the, the jewelry and gifts from the other Egyptians and they left without any sort of military resistance. And people say, well, they had to avoid these forts along the border of, of uh, Egypt. That doesn't mesh because Pharaoh let them go. What happens next, of course, is that in chapter 13 and verse 20, we're told that they are on the edge of the wilderness. They're about to leave Egypt. And by the way, they're at a place called Etam. And Etam, that the Tam part of Etam may well reflect the name of the god Atum. Atum is the name of the deity who is, whose name is preserved in the, again, the Arabic name for this area today is Wadi Tumilat, the god Atum, the sun god. So it could well be that they're on the very edge of this Wadi Tumilat, Etam, and at this point, Exodus 14, 2 says, uh, the instructions to Moses was, okay, turn back. Turn back towards this new coordinates I'm giving you, Pihacherot, Migdal, and the sea. And of course, that, much to our chagrin, leads us right up to the very area where they were originally avoiding. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's where these places are. Um, and, and so I'm compelled to go where the geography leads me, not where, where I'd like to see them go. In this scenario, the Israelites would have traveled about 27 miles to their first campsite, but only about seven miles to the second site of Etham. Now, Etham is not a very long distance away. It's just over here. This place is called the Plateau Giza, and it's a higher area, slightly higher than the rest of the region. And it's a crossing point for the way of shore, the, the route that goes all the way to Beersheba and Hebron. This is the place where they have to turn back. This is the place where Moses is told to turn back by God. And in fact, if you think about it, if Etham is uh, the word for Egyptian hetem, which is the word for border fortress, there would have been a big garrison of Egyptians sitting there. In the Egyptian approach, all these events leading to the sea parting seem to be taking place in a very small area. Was this the desert wilderness the Israelites really crossed or did they cross a much larger wilderness? There's a big difference between these two options. Where would you put the second camp on the edge of the wilderness? Etham is one of the most critical markers for all the crossing points, of which of all the potential crossing points that I'm aware of, this one here is the only one that fits perfectly where they're genuinely trapped. They came over here, they stopped at Etham, they came to a dead end. Why? because there's a series of mountains that go all the way over here, and it's, it's impassable. You cannot, you cannot walk through here. The water comes straight down in a sharp angle. They're really trapped hard here. And Pharaoh realized this geography, that he could come down, and if he could just get to right up here at Sukkoth. Mm -hmm. Get up here? 
He's got them. Mm -hmm. He figures he's got them trapped. So he comes down with his 600 chariots, and they would stop right about here. Now, the key is that it was at Etham where it triggered the idea that they were aimlessly wandering. Why I would pick this area for Adam. Glenn Fritz has a different edge of the wilderness for his location of Etham. And then the wilderness of Adam would be the backdrop of that containing the rough wilderness. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an expansion of just the idea of Adam. And Adam was just a general term for the shore of the sea. And it, Moses used very general geographical descriptions. Large areas of terrain, large landscapes were used and given a simple name. And so when he uses the word Adam, it's a general term, we're on the shore of the sea. Well, we'd say, my goodness, he's 20 miles inland from the sea. But in his reckoning and his way of writing about the geography, with very few other landmarks to select or, or mention, he's on the shore of the sea here with this encampment. Well, looking at this historically, in Coptic Egyptian, the word Etam appears, similar spelling and pronunciation, and it means the boundary of the sea, very simple definition. This is saying Atu, Atu? Etam. Etam. Yeah, this, oh. this is a U would be a, a, essentially the Greek mu character. Oh, okay. So you're seeing the M on the end, but it's represented by a U because okay. the, the Coptic is, alphabet is, is different mm -hmm. than, than our alphabet. In the Arabic, Etihama or Tama is the coastal zone of the Red Sea in Northwest Arabia. And Tama or Tahama is translated as land sloping toward the sea. Burton wrote this in 1879 from his travels in Midian. What we understand from these uses is that Adam referred to the littoral, the shoreline of the Gulf. And so it could exist on both sides of the Gulf because it was the shoreline. Mm -hmm. It was the terrain sloping toward the sea. One of the difficulties that you see with having a crossing over at this location here, what challenges would there be to the story? My major objection is that we're told in, in, in Numbers 33 that Moses recorded the campsites stage by stage and in Numbers 33 and in Exodus 12 and following, we find out that they go from Ramesses to Sukkot and Etam, and they haven't left Egypt yet. They're on the edge of the wilderness, and then they make this turn and cross the sea. If they make a turn some other way and are, are traveling across this 160 miles and doing that to the next campsite, which is down here, is very hard to explain. If we take the itinerary seriously, that this is a campsite by campsite record, as Numbers 33 presents it, then it's very hard to explain how they go all that distance to get to this crossing point. That's the, the major thing for me. My understanding was that it didn't actually say how many days it took before they got to the crossing. That's correct, but my, I'm working from the assumption that that the, the recordings of the campsites, that they are, they are all recorded and we have, I'm assuming that they have a, a, a sequence in mind. Uh, this would have to require, my guess is somewhere about eight more days of travel mm -hmm. at about a 20 mile day flip, which is, seems to be the average day's journey uh, in the ancient world. Uh, there's, no, there's no room between the end of Exodus 13 and the beginning of Exodus 14 for that eight-day trip. That's my problem. Of course, those in the Hebrew approach would dispute the assumption that at the first two campsites, the Israelites were still in Egypt. So the people of Israel were here at the border. We know that from the biblical text. They were just waiting for the, the order to cross the border and to go out into the desert or the wilderness. They had permission for to walk out in the desert for three days to worship God. So we have the order that arrives to the people of Israel and within the same day, within one day, it says that they crossed the border. This is an important piece of information because it means that they went in one certain direction. And they were close to the eastern border and they went across that border. The biblical text is also very clear that they did not go towards the north 
and they did not go in any other direction either. They crossed the border here, they entered into this trade route. And then they went in this direction, following the route 